It's my pleasure uh, to begin by introducing Dr. Serena Sabatini. Serena is a postdoc on the IDEAL programme. She also recently, congratulations, uh, received mm -hmm. her PhD. So Serena, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cathy. You have already introduced me. So, so why I'm here, I'm here today uh, together with uh, Cathy, Jared, uh, Liz and Jane, because we all believe it's time to rethink dementia. Thank you. Okay, but uh, first things first, what is dementia? Here I have provided a definition of dementia, but uh, basically all you need to know is that dementia is an umbrella term that is used to refer to several conditions, all affecting memory and or um, other cognitive abilities, such as the ability to communicate. And because of people with dementia have these uh, cognitive difficulties, they also can find it hard to conduct some activities of their daily life, such as uh, shopping, uh, cooking meals, and uh, dressing. There are many different types of dementia. The most common one is Alzheimer's disease, but other common types are uh, vascular dementia, dementia with lower bodies, and frontotemporal dementia. And uh, all these uh, different types of dementia affect different cognitive abilities, especially at the earliest stages of the condition. So one thing I want to stress about dementia is that it is a progressive disease. So this means that um, the cognitive difficulties that people with dementia have are milder at the beginning of the condition, but they become more and more severe as the condition progresses. So this is something very, very important to keep in mind because when we think about dementia, we often have in mind only the late stage of the condition when people are more impaired, but on the earlier stages, uh, people with dementia can still do uh, many things. They may require some support and some adjustments, but they can still do uh, many things. This uh, does not mean that earlier stages of dementia are not challenging. Each stage of dementia has its own specific uh, difficulties. Uh, moreover, uh, people with dementia have also to face age-related challenges. Uh, these could be other illnesses, uh, mobility problems, uh, pain, uh, problems with their hearing or with their sight, and even reduce uh, energy. There are also many other um, difficulties that are related to the way in which our society treats older people, which is not always positive. Uh, for instance, it can be harder for older people to be given important roles within society compared to uh, younger people. But uh, so on the one hand, all these difficulties and challenges uh, can, um, can have a negative impact on what is the quality of life of people living with dementia. But on the other hand, we also see that people with dementia can show high levels of resilience. And with the right adjustments and uh, support, they can engage in many activities, including gardening, uh, singing, uh, cooking, and even using the internet. So basically doing whatever they like doing and whatever helps them to uh, maintain a positive outlook in life. Here we have even example of people with dementia who are activists and they have done all sorts of amazing things. Uh, some of them have written poems, others have written books and others again have produced paintings and even banners. So and what, uh, what all these people have in common is that they are trying to let us know what it's like to live uh, with dementia. And perhaps we should listen to them more often. Sadly, uh, this more heterogeneous um, depiction of dementia, of a condition that although it involves some challenges and difficulties, it does not eradicate all positive aspects of life is not always depicted in uh, the media and in uh, publications. And I believe that Leeds will tell you a, bit, a little bit more about this uh, later on. What I want to focus on uh, with the remaining of uh, my presentation is on how people with dementia uh, perceive themselves. 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a study we conducted in order to figure out how people uh, with dementia perceive their own aging and whether those who perceive their aging more positively also uh, report having a better quality of life. So what we did is we first uh, look at the attitudes toward their own aging that people with dementia had. And uh, we did so by asking people with dementia to complete some questions about how they feel about getting older. And we asked 1,537 people with dementia to complete these questions. And so some of these questions capture uh, some positive uh, attitudes uh, toward getting older. And for instance, an example of positive attitude is uh, feeling as happy as they were when they were younger. Where, but there were also other questions capturing negative attitudes towards getting older. And an example of negative attitude is feeling less useful than when they were younger. So we put together the answers provided by all the 1,537 participating people with dementia. And what we found is that uh, people with dementia have a mix of positive and negative feelings about getting older. So for example, 64% reporting being as happy as when they were younger, whereas 36% uh, reporting being less happy than when they were younger. Another example is that about half of participants felt less useful than when they were younger, whereas a less than, slightly less than half felt as useful as when they were younger. And again, this may be due to older people having fewer opportunities to, to be useful and feel useful. We also asked to the same group of people with dementia um, um, how they feel about their lives. So we did so by asking them um, um, to rate as good or poor several aspects of their life, including uh, their memory, uh, their physical, um, physical health, and also their living situation. And again, also this time we put together the answers provided by everyone. And here for ease of representation, we divided participants into three groups. So the group, the first group includes those uh, people who scored the lower on the quality of life questionnaire compared to the two remaining groups. And the second group includes those participants who scored in the middle uh, compared to the two remaining groups in the quality of life questionnaire. And the third group includes those participants who scored the higher on the quality of life questionnaire compared to the two remaining groups. So now I want to show you a graph which represents the levels of attitudes towards their own aging that people with dementia had in relation to the levels of uh, quality of life that they reported. So for those of you who are not familiar with graphs, on the arrow at the bottom of the graph, we have levels of quality of life, and we have the group who scored the lower on the quality of life questionnaire on the left side of the graph, and the group who scored the higher on the quality of life questionnaire on the right side of the graph. Whereas on the arrow on the left side of the graph, we have a levels of attitudes towards um, their own aging that people with dementia reported, and these um, can lie on a continuum and we have more positive attitudes on the top of the graph and uh, more negative attitudes at the bottom of the arrow. So as you can see here um, um, on the left side of the graph, the first group, which is the group who reported lower level of quality of life, also reported mostly negative attitudes towards their own aging. Whereas the group in, in the middle of the graph, which is the group reported uh, middle levels of quality of life compared to the two remaining groups, this group reported a mix of positive and negative attitudes toward their own aging. And finally, the group that is represented on the right side of the graph, which is the group reported higher levels of quality of life compared to the two remaining groups, uh, reported mostly positive attitudes towards their own aging. Therefore, having a positive attitude uh, towards their own aging helps people with dementia to live better. So in summary, what we found is that being positive about aging 
and uh, being positive uh, for people with dementia uh, matters. So perhaps if we all start thinking of dementia as a condition that although it does involve uh, challenges and problems, it does not eradicate all positive aspects of life, uh, people with dementia may start thinking about themselves and about their aging in a more positive way. And this uh, may uh, lead to living a better life. So I just want to thank you all for listening and I leave it over to Cathy and Gerard. A good friend of ours, Willie Gilder, was going to be talking tonight, but he's in hospital uh, getting heart surgery, uh, which has been a long time coming. So I'm kind of glad he's in there to be in some respect because he's been needing it for a while and he's obviously on the way to recovery now, which is a, a better thing indeed. Uh, so as a replacement, I'm not quite as eloquent as uh, William Afraid, but uh, I will speak the best I can and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy what I have to say. Now, when someone is diagnosed with dementia, that person doesn't automatically or suddenly change overnight into the perceived image of PVC armchairs and listening to violin songs. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I would have been horrified if I experienced anything like that after being diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's disease at the age of 55. Vera Lynn? Who's Vera Lynn? Give me the buzzcocks, the stranglers, the clash, Iggy Pop. Oh, and don't forget the pesh mode, just to name a few. Truth be told, in real life, it is a world that changes overnight and turns us back on you after a diagnosis of dementia. Because of the shame and stigma attached to dementia and the way it has been portrayed for many, many years, academics, professionals, and people in general appear to be under the impression that overnight you change from a, a, a fully functioning and contributing member of society into someone who is incapable of making a decision for themselves and requires uh, round the clock supervision 24 seven. Truth be told, this may well happen uh, to me uh, as my uh, disease progresses um, at its end stage. However, before this happens, there's a beginning and a middle, or what I like to refer to as a middle stage and a moderate stage, sorry, a mild stage and a moderate stage. During these initial stages, and although I do have vision awareness problems, my memory is not as great as what it used to be. It takes me more time to get out of bed in the morning and to get dressed. I am still able to function at a high enough level to carry out many day-to-day -day tasks given to me. Being diagnosed with dementia is already a, serious, a series of losses. Don't make it worse by forcing me uh, to listen to old World War II songs was playing bingo or asking me to recognize famous faces. Of course I recognize famous faces. They are after all famous. For far too long, people with dementia have been dis discreetly pushed to the side. People speak on our behalf and people make decisions on our behalf. But the simple fact of the matter is that the only person who truly knows what it's like to live with dementia is somebody who has dementia. And so when people in general, professionals and organizations realize that dementia does not define the person and that the person can still contribute to society and the fulfilling life, then that will be an extremely bright light at the end of what has been a long, dark tunnel. During mild and moderate stage dementia, a person still has a lot to say and still has a lot to give and offer. Come talk to the expert, experts, ask us questions. Involve us at an early stage in research. Allow us to have a voice. Let us get involved in your dementia projects from the foundations up. Not only will you learn something, you may even just get things right first time round. In doing so, you'll also give that person living with dementia a reason to get out of bed in the morning. To give that person back those feelings of self-worth, dignity, and pride. And you will allow that person to make a difference 
and contribute once again to society, leading to a much more fulfilling life, which will enable that person to flourish and live really well with dementia. Now, to finish up, I'd just like to uh, give you a little insight into what it's like for me to live a month uh, with, uh, in the life of, basically, live a month in the life of a demented poet, as I like to call myself. Over the past few weeks, I have attended various face-to-face -face dementia strategy workshops all over Fife to gather thoughts and experiences from members of the public with regard to dementia care in Fife in order to reshape Fife Council's dementia strategy for the next three years. I was privileged to be a member of the Life Changes Trust Local Legacy Funding Panel to assess a number of applications from organizations all over Scotland looking to create dementia-friendly projects in their local areas. I attend weekly face-to-face -face sessions with, a, with, our second, uh, with our second A Good Life with Dementia course. This is a course written by people with dementia and the course is for people also living with dementia who have been recently diagnosed. The aim of the course is to enable a person recently diagnosed with dementia to realize that they, have not, they, that they are not alone in their dementia journey. And through their lived experience and peer support, there are ways and means to overcome adversity and to live well with dementia. I've had the privilege of attending various Age Scotland subgroups with regards to befriending and peer support, human rights and technology, all whose aims is to provide education and advice from people with fixed uh, with lived experience of dementia in the aforementioned subjects. I had the honour and pleasure of hosting a workshop uh, with regard to peer support for Age Scotland's Dementia Friendly Communities Online Learning event. I attended month-to-month -month face gatherings in our face-to-face uh, -face gatherings in our peer support group stand, where I spent some uh, uh, some great time with very special friends, whilst whiling away the hours, drinking tea, eating cake, and putting the world to right. I am a member of a small research group who met with a young PhD student from Edinburgh University. We meet on a monthly basis to carry out research with regard to volunteering and dementia. I had the honour and pleasure of providing a dementia awareness training session to a um, class full of students from St. Andrews University with regard to living with dementia as part of their studies. I had the honor and privilege of attending uh, a fledgling peer support group of people living with dementia and their wives, husbands, partners, and carers. In a neighboring town, this group sprung up as a consequence of our previous Good Life with Dementia course. All the students on that course decided that they enjoyed each other's company so much, they decided to start up their own peer support group, and it's been amazing. Like. I've been involved in research, in a research session in Muse Meaningful Music, which is a research project being carried out by Edinburgh University. I took part uh, on an interview panel for people with lived experience of dementia, where we interviewed applicants for pro proposed full-time posts with Age Scotland. Out with these monthly ex uh, excursions, uh, one of my proudest moments, however, being part of a recent conference in Dundee. Uh, the conference was organized by people living with dementia, all the guest speakers were people living with dementia, and all the audience members, apart from a handful, were people living with dementia. A totally inspiring couple of days, there was tears, it was laughter, but it was such an amazing experience. I have also uh, been involved in, what can I say here really, uh, in the release of an EP by a group of men who we call ourselves the Demented Poets. We are a small group, a small group of demented men who had uh, been asked to write poems uh, with regard to our deepest feelings. These poems were then turned into songs and the tunes for the songs were based on the kind of music that we liked in our youth, 
which was amazing. So mine was like Depeche Mode, a style. One of the boys was um, Beatles style. Another one was like really old, like sort of like uh, Gaelic, sort of Kaylee sort of style music, like. And uh, the songs came up really well. Um, so that's just a few things that I've been doing over the last few months. Um, just to let you know that uh, we don't sit in armchairs, listen to violin, uh, and keep us busy. We'll be very happy to keep busy. Um, the longer we keep busy, the longer we'll be able to stay in our homes and live well and have very meaningful lives. Uh, and I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Gerald, for that, which was amazing. And I'm so sorry that I had uh, the tech catastrophe that one dreads <laughs> right at that moment. So, yes, um, Gerald very kindly um, stood in for his stand pal. So stand stands for striving towards a new day, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so this is um, a, a group in Fife. And yes, so Willie Gilder couldn't be here with us tonight, but I wanted to just share with you in the chat um, uh, a link to one of his videos and a link to his quite incredible Twitter account where he is recovering in hospital and yet drawing everything he can see. It really is amazing. So thank you, Gerald, and also thank you uh, to, to Willie, who is here in spirit. Um, so yes. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, okay, so next up we have um, Dr. Elizabeth Barry, who is um, Associate Professor of Literature at Warwick, where she teaches, among other things, um, theatre is a particular specialty, isn't it? Um, so Liz, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Cathy. I'm just delighted to be here. And thank you to both speakers for you know, really thought provoking and yeah, wonderful talk so far. Okay. So I want to talk today about the lived experience of dementia and touch on dementia care, um, and in particular, the experience of time in these conditions. But I also want to talk about laughter. Um, you may feel um, that dementia is, is no laughing matter, um, but there's an awful lot of laughter amongst those with dementia and as part of the, the many faceted practice of care. Even those who lose much of their language in the later stages of dementia are able to laugh um, and more than this, um, deploy laughter as a kind of conversational strategy um, and build sequences around getting a joint laugh. And I want to talk today about these enduring capacities. So I'm talking about late stage dementia, but I'm talking about things that people can still do even when they lose a lot of, of their language. Um, and how the way in which laughter might not only be life affirming and, and often saving for those living with dementia, but might also reveal much about the relationship to time that we have if we find ourselves in that position. If memory loss happens in the condition of dementia, um, then the loss of the ability to remember can also affect the ability to expect, to predict what will happen as we lose our memory of what has come before. As Thomas de Baggio, living with dementia, describes the disease, it's the eager beast in my brain gobbling time in both directions everything can start to feel unexpected at very late stages. And the fact of this is itself unexpected. We can lose what the philosopher Françoise Dastieu calls the paradoxical capacity to await surprise. You know, surprises can be pleasant or unpleasant, of course, but, but both kinds of response, I think, can, can start to be lost along with the sort of default relationship to time that, that another philosopher, de Praz, calls the serene vigilance with which we expect novelty, we expect new things to happen. And what can replace those feelings um, in this late stage dementia can sort of feel a bit like a constant queasiness, um, an unease uh, that can't quite name itself. But I think people with dementia have lots of strategies, as I'm going to talk about, to, to address and sort of deal with that experience. And they retain those, you know, as, a, as I want to say, um, even with the loss of language. 
in a study by Linda Clare and colleagues, and Linda's here tonight, um, which is great, participants living with dementia um, gave voice to these kind of feelings of unease. You know, one saying, well, I don't know what they're going to do with me in here. I don't know why they've put me in here. And another described the unsettling quality of being unable to remember or predict the future. I feel as though I'm some queer creature who's come to earth here, but who I don't know. The loss of the ability to expect creates a condition of profound restlessness. Thomas de Baggio talks in his account of his own dementia, of, of a convulsive time of stumbling and future loss. But laughter might, in this condition, offer a way to take control, um, at least briefly, of one's communication, to enjoy mutual and equal interactions, and to give structure to an otherwise rather ungraspable time. As an example, here's a passage from a classic work on dementia care, John Killick and Kate Allen's Communication in the Care of People with Dementia. John Killick is describing a photograph taken of him and, and Kath Waters, who had late stage dementia and with whom he was working. He says, in the photograph, we're standing in the unit, my left hand clasping Kath's. We are laughing. Kath's eyes are closed with, I guess, the intensity of the feeling. It's a shared joke, one of many. But since she uses little language, it may be something we have noticed and looked at. Or it may have been that one of us has thought of something and merriment has spilled over onto the other. As always, there is a complicity that goes beyond words. Developmental psychologists have, have looked at the process of clowning, of kind of absurd behaviours such as nonverbal jokes, hiding and revealing faces and objects, pulling faces, um, as a means of establishing and maintaining communication before a shared language is present. And Killick also describes the kind of clowning that we carry on doing throughout our lives, clowning with water's sort of playful rituals of greeting and farewell, for instance, as a way for both of them to establish and maintain connection without language and on equal terms. Psychologist Vasudevi Reddy writes about such clowning as a stage in developing joint attention. So not sort of reorienting someone's attention wholly to a third object, but establishing this kind of mutuality between self and other that can then kind of expand to involve other topics. And this structure might be useful in thinking about the laughter between John Killick and Kath Waters in the last example, where their mutuality was expanded, this sort of communion between them was expanded to involve the topic of the thing they noticed and looked at. Or conversely, the pleasure of the private thought of one of them spills over to involve the other. The crucial difference, um, perhaps, with, with earlier sort of instances of clowning in one's life is the kind of reversibility of the exchange in Killick's example. So it could be Waters' private thought, which she may be unable to express in words, just as well as it could be Killick's, that causes a merriment that the other can catch. Laughter is both the medium and the end goal of such kind of creative interactions. And in, in Vasudevi Reddy's terms, the ongoing interaction itself can be seen as a kind of object of attention, um, a sort of you know, a goal um, that is held in play and shared by both. And at a stage before language is completely lost, words themselves are sort of often repurposed as ways of communicating. Um, so, you know, language isn't just in these interactions kind of ways of making propositions or communicating ideas. Um, Eleanor Fuchs writes in her wonderful memoir, Making an Exit, of her interaction with her mother when the latter has developed dementia. And the function of language as a kind of, of object of attention in itself, a, a kind of, of, of clowning, um, a kind of object of clowning, Fuchs writes, Almost daily on the telephone, we have our weird little chats, our excursions into zero degree speech, 
speech without intention or result. Hello, mother, I begin, and mother lobs back enthusiastically. Hello, my mother, dother, rubber, brother, dear, dear, lovey, dovey. And then her mother goes on. There was a lot of starting at the beginning. Starting at the beginning. Oh, this is marvellous, I chuckle. Mother always laughs when she hears a laugh and we hang up laughing. Language without intention or result nonetheless creates and maintains positive and mutual feeling. And th this is a sort of performance of conversation, a kind of game of conversation, doesn't sort of mean it's just going through the motions. It's, it's a sort of performance of being a linguistic creature that celebrates the things that human language can do. Even while from one perspective, it's sort of failing to do these from in, in a normal way. And the sort of the so-called problem with this language that it's not joined to its present, you know, the present context becomes a kind of opportunity for creativity and play here. And if we if we just look briefly at laughter itself um, as a it's also, I think, revealing and expanding on these possibilities for communication. So Harvey Sachs, the father of conversational analysis, has a short reflection in writing on conversation on laughing together in terms of temporal sequence. He says, laughing together is special and interesting for conversation because there aren't many things that people do in talk together. Laughter is one of the few things lawfully done together. But not only is it lawfully, because we're supposed to be turn-taking in conversation, but, but laughing is not only lawfully done together, but it should be done together. Um, you know, Fuchs talking about her mother always laughing when she is a laugh. Um, and Sack says, laughing together is characterizable as going after various parties laughing separately. So a sequence might be organized around getting a joint laugh. Sorry. And we see that kind of that building of sequence and of organizing time in these interactions, you know, even when language is not doing all the work it, it might normally do. Um, and, it, and getting a shared laugh can be a kind of a shared project in Sachs's terms and an object of shared attention that can improve communication and trust between caregiver and those with a dementia diagnosis. And I can I could share if I had longer examples from the sociolinguistic literature of that. So if we pay attention to these temporal features of conversation, game and ritual, we can see that laughter doesn't always exhaust itself in the moment. Those with dementia, whether or not they still have other kinds of, of language at their disposal, use laughter to build communication, to organize time and create the kind of melody of communication um, that can continue beyond and outside of sense-making. It can be what the novelist Arthur Kersler calls a temporary relief from utilitarian pressures um, and allow uh, those with dementia control, but also creativity in their communication. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you so much, um, Liz. That was marvelous. And yeah, it really makes you think about uh, the nature of conversation, something that perhaps we, we take for granted. So as I say, last but very much not least, um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Jane Ward. Um, now Jane is head of Dementia Friendly Hampshire, um, but I know her because uh, she is one of the members of the Always Group, Action on Living Well, Asking You, um, which is the incredible involvement group that has been working alongside and inspiring and uh, keeping on the right course, uh, the ideal programme since 2015. 14. So it's an absolute pleasure. Um, and Jane, you have asked me to share some photos. We'll see how that goes with the tech. You may regret that choice. <laughs> um, well, I trust you. We've done a lot together, so I'll, I'll trust you. Um, so when I was up, or well, Catherine asked me to take part in this, um, I was thinking about rethinking dementia. What are the important things that I harp on about a lot to anyone that will listen? And I know there's a few people on this call who, please, I'll apologize if you might have heard this before. Um, but for me, one of the key things I think we have to think about differently maybe is we're starting to do really well on person-centered care and really understanding what that means. 
looking at the person. So if you're looking at the person with dementia, not just ticking a box, but actually really thinking about who they are, what they want, what their dreams are, how they would like us to treat them, how they want to treat us. Um, we need to do the same for the carers because I'm a former carer and a diagnosis of dementia doesn't just happen to the person. It happens to their family, it happens to their friends, it happens to the people around them. But what we forget to think about is the relationship between particularly the, the key carer and the person who's living with dementia. So for me, my main one was my mother. I looked after my mum who had vascular dementia and I realised she was getting lost a bit. Um, and so was I in a way, because after her diagnosis, she became the person with dementia and I became the carer. And as mum used to say, but I'm the mum because I became really protective of her. Um, almost wanted to wrap her in cotton wool and put her on a shelf and keep her safe because suddenly I'm, I'm responsible for her. And it was quite a scary thing. And I really overdid it. And I think a lot of us do. Um, and I had to learn, and she taught me, that actually that was one of her key roles in life was to teach me. And she also looked after me. And she'd always looked after me. She was my mum. So I realised that, and, and it was quite interesting to hear both um, Serena talking about how many people wanted to feel useful and Gerald also talking a lot about how important it was for him to still feel useful. So for mum, I had to think about, okay, those two key roles for her because I was an only child and she was a, a stay-at-home mum and um, a really good one, I hasten to add. Um, I might be a bit biased there, but she was incredible. And uh, so important thing for her was to teach me. And we both have a passion for gardens. So she taught me a lot about gardening and I found that that was something we could keep doing. And on a good day, she'd say to me, well, you know how to take cuttings. And it was quite obvious for her that I would actually, oh, and here she is. So that's my mum gardening. So it was quite um, obvious for her on a good day if I, you know, you should know this, but I'd say, well, I, I've been having some failures recently. So actually I thought maybe you could teach me and I'd hope that your memory would mean that you wouldn't remember. Um, and on a bad day, she'd have no idea. I mean, she might even not even realize who I was, but she would sit up in her chair. She'd sit up and she'd smile and she'd teach me how to take cuttings. And it made her day because she was useful. She was doing something that was really meaningful to her. Um, on that picture, she was probably for about the fourth or fifth time putting those plants back into those pots because in the evening I'd take them back out, put them into little pots. And um, we kept doing that until those poor plants started looking a bit sad and we had to get some more. Um, and she didn't always remember, but that the most important thing for her was she was working with me, deciding which pots we we're going to do, um, showing me how to plant them. And it was the about the time that she spending and the interaction between the two of us rather than actually those pots and the other thing she could do she, as being my mum was it's quite an emotional thing when you're going through looking after someone it's frustrating it's it's sad and I used to have a lot of emotions and at first I used to think I'm the carer my job's to be the strong one my job's to be the one that looks after my mum and I can't cry and I can't get upset in front of her that I, we don't do that with carers but actually her big role for me was when I was bullied at school or when I was going through things at work or my marriage breakup and various other things I went through in my life. She always was the one that actually arms around me, made me a cup of tea. And then after we'd had the hug and the cup of tea, I'd sit down in front of her with my knee on her lap and she just stroked my hair. And that was something she could do despite her dementia. And actually sometimes it was when maybe she was quite frustrated and well, when, you, when you've, you're when you in that situation, who do you take out on? The person that you know is gonna be there, the, no, the person you know that you trust to have your back. So when she was feeling frustrated, she would take out on me. Why wouldn't she? But I'm human being as well. So we actually got into this wonderful thing where when it did happen, she would sit down and she would actually just have my, my head in her knee and she'd stroke my hair and she'd make me feel better. So I got what I needed from her and she got what she needed, which was she got to be useful again, which is so important to her. Um, 
And the other thing she, she taught me was actually, I still need to live. And we were doing a piece of work with Hampshire County Council about what older people need out of life. And she came up with a strap line to this, this work. And there was about 10 or 11 people, older people, um, two of which had dementia. And it was the final meeting where the council was saying, we need to think about you know, the strap lines that go on the report. And mom came up with this wonderful phrase, there's no point in keeping us alive if we don't have a life. And I took that to heart and thought, okay, we're gonna go out and we're gonna do stuff. So my other big thing I harp on about is, is the risk. And I learned that, yeah, you've got to be worried about the physical risk. What if, what if she goes out and gets lost? And she did a few times because she loved to explore. Um, what if she falls over? What if, but when you're doing that, you forget about the kind of social risk. And I think we've all had a classic example of that with lockdown of how much we need people around us. I mean, we just look at what's going on with mental health and, and isolation at the moment. And when you get a diagnosis of dementia, I think quite often it's, it's easy for you to become incredibly isolated, both of you, the carer and the person, because people get a bit frightened about getting into your life. What am I gonna say? Am I gonna say the wrong thing? Am I gonna, you know, how are they gonna behave? I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to be with this person now. And they forget that this is just a human being you've known for a long time who has some memory problems. And so things might change and, and there's a lot of information out there you can find, but people, I think, get a bit scared and they back off. So you can get very emotionally isolated, sorry, um, socially isolated. So there's a big social risk there of what might happen if you don't get out and do things. And then there's the emotional risk. And um, I volunteer with Dementia Adventure. And please do Google it. They're great. Um, they take people on holiday and they do all sorts of things, getting people out and, out and about. And they do a lot of work about this thing about balancing risk and looking at taking care of the physical aspects of someone and, and trying to stop them getting hurt. You forget about the emotional part and what people need. And most of us, I mean, as Gerald said, we don't like the thought of sitting in a you know, plastic chair. And why would someone want to do that for the rest of their, rest of their life? You know, our proudest moments have been, and if you think back, if you're going to tell someone what's your proud proudest thing you've ever done in your life it's not sitting in a chair looking out of a window it's about whatever you've done you know mine's water white water rafting brilliant used to do it when I was younger um so let's get people out doing things a bit more and if we can perhaps share the second photograph um I had an auntie this is Anna Marie coming up so this is Anna Marie she's my aunt um German lady who emigrated to Canada in the early 60s met mum's younger brother who'd gone over there in the in the early 50s married him and I first went over in my when I was 20 and Anne-Marie she, she taught me how to kayak and it had been something that we always did when we went over there um her husband Ray was was terrified of water as was my mum both frightened of, dr of, of drowning because neither of them ever learned how to swim so Anne-Marie and I'd go out and we'd kayak together and we lost my uncle Ray six weeks before we lost mum back in 2013. And I went over to his memorial and it was held at a friend's place who had this lake. And about an hour into the um, event, which was, was a barbecue with lots of people talking about Ray and his life. And he was a great ecologist. He was, he was brilliant. Um, we started getting the kayaks out and I was, a bit, I was really nervous when Anne-Marie got in. And they all said, no, it's fine. She's fine. She does it all the time. Every time she comes here, she does this. And it took her within a minute, she got back into how do I hold the oar and off she went. And our biggest problem wasn't any risk to her. Our biggest problem was how do we get her back in before nightfall? And I took this picture and I got it printed and I took it to the, the home where she was staying. And I thought she might like it framed in her, her room. And she said, no, I want it on the door. I want people to know who I am. They can see the pictures of me skiing and kayaking and walking and everything when I'm younger, but they think I'm old now and they don't think I'm that person. So she had it on her door. And I went back about two or three years later. And by that time she'd forgotten niece, Jane, all of that. She just came up, pointed at me and she said, you took my favorite picture of me. And she took me to the door and showed me. And 
that was so proud and she still connected with that because this is this is how she wanted people to see her but she was someone who could still do things and she was someone that still loved to be outside all of our trips when we went out i used to i always had a hard car and we used to go off into the mountains and we'd walk a little bit when she could and when she couldn't we'd just sit and wait for wildlife to come hopefully and see us and um it was really important to her that that was her facet of life and that people remembered who she was and i think we've got to think about people so you know what were their dreams what were their aspirations and what can we still do so thank you Thank you, Jane. That's actually quite difficult to then say thank you to. But thank you to all of our amazing speakers.